Okay, Christy, let's start over. <laughs> Christy Philip Grossman, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Christy, tell us the name of your business again and where you're joining us from. I am the CEO and founder of Ops Boss Coaching and I am in Northern Virginia, so I'm cheating because it's after 9 a.m. here. Um, and our team is all around the country. We are all virtual, so we're um, everywhere. Okay, well, thank you so much for joining us. How, first and foremost, how did we as the 6 a.m.ers find you? How did you come to us? I think um, I've actually uh, been on the 6 a.m.ers East Coast. and. Got it. I know Sky from a long time ago. I think we met at a mastermind way back in the day. Okay, got it, got it. Well, let's start, Christy. Tell us a little bit. Let's go straight into um, what your business is. What's Ops Boss Admin Coaching? What is that? So my background is that I was on a real estate team for 23 years, one of the top teams in the country, and I am super, super passionate about the admin operations side. And what I observed over my 23 years is that I yarn to be in spaces like we are in today with high-minded people talking about things but I, I really wanted to be with the people that did what I did, the wizards behind the screen. And so um, Ops Boss Coaching is a company that provides classes, group coaching, one-on-one -on -one coaching. We do an annual retreat and we're a community of operations minded people. I love that. So, okay. So 23 years, you, you, you were in real estate for 23 years. What brought you to real estate in the first place? Um, being born into a real estate family, which I'm guessing <laughs> many people on this call can identify with. That seems to be a pretty common theme. Grew up in a real estate family with a top producing agent mom and swore I would never be in real estate in a million years and ended up in the mortgage business for 10 and then decided I actually wanted balance in my life. And I thought I could find that in real estate. And actually I have. So um, surprise, surprise, right? Actually did find balance in real estate. Uh, tell us a little, boy, I'd love to hear about this journey. Tell us about how you found balance in real estate. So I will be, it, those of you, I think I, I know a few of you on the call, I am very authentic. So what you see is what you get, and I'll tell you the real story. So the real story is when I was in the mortgage business, I was a workaholic. I love what I do. I love operations, whether that's mortgage, real estate, whatever. And we have two adopted girls and um, went through a lot to get to the point of having our family and my husband was a stay-at-home dad. And one night he brought the girls in to have ice cream with me at the conference table at the mortgage office at eight o'clock at night so we could have dessert together before they went to bed. Because if I didn't um, do that, I wouldn't see them that day. And I woke up the next day and I said, this is crazy. What am I thinking? I've waited all this time to have a family and so I went to my family at that point, my mom and my brother were in business together and there were no real estate teams back in the day. And I said, I think we need to have a real estate team. You need me and I need you. And we said, we'll try this for a year, see how it goes. And 23 years later, it went pretty well. Well, you know, thank you so much for being open and honest, Christy. I think probably a lot of us on the call have had their, our moments where our children have either been that guiding light for us, the North Star to really redirect us to what's truly meaningful, whether it's them coming into your office at eight o'clock at night because you're still working or a statement they make like, why is mommy or daddy always on their phone? Whatever that statement is that can really shock us back into what's truly important. So, okay, tell us a little bit more. So you go to your, your family who's in real estate. I need you and you need me. And this wasn't something that, um, this wasn't something that a lot of teams were doing at that point. So how did you begin to 
proactively take charge essentially of the admin aspect of the real estate team. How did that start? How did it begin for you? Well, you know, it was interesting because like I said, I'd been running seven offices of a mortgage company in three states when I did this. And so I thought I knew a lot about real estate. And what I realized was there was still a huge learning curve. Um, And really, I just started taking things off their plate. Anything I could do that I never had a real estate license. So I didn't do, you know, showings or any of that stuff. But anything I could do, like, let's just build the database. Let's go through. And they didn't have a CRM. I mean, this this was back in the 90s. So this was a long time ago. Um, So we just started from scratch with building the database, setting up our marketing, processing transactions, anything I could take off their plate, I took it off their plate. And over time, of course, I needed to hire leverage as well. And we built a team. Um, But we didn't go into it intending to build a large team. We just wanted to go into it with everybody doing what they were really good at, right? You know, if you're great at negotiation, do the negotiation. You're great with buyers, go and show property. I'm a huge introvert, believe it or not, despite I'm on a call with 200 people, I'm a huge (laughs) introvert. I love being behind the scenes. So I did all the behind the scenes stuff to make everything run. And it just, it worked really well because everyone could lean into their skill set. And then over time we grew. Wow. So how did you know at that point, what did you, what were the questions you asked? How did you find out what needed to be taken off their plates. You know, I always think about in the admin role being one step ahead of the real estate agent that's out there selling. You have to be one step ahead, but how do you even figure out how to be one step ahead? I think in the beginning, I had to do a lot of observation and note-taking and shadowing. Like I said, as much as I knew and you know, I was an, I was a closer. I was a loan processor. I was an underwriter. I had the highest signing authority at my mortgage company, which was a national company. I knew a lot about real estate and contracts and all the things. And yet there was a huge gap that I didn't know. I didn't know what happened on a listing appointment. What happens at a buyer consultation? What are you talking about when you're actually showing a property? So I did a lot of shadowing and a lot of, of taking notes And then going through and saying, well, what can I do to prepare them so that they can only focus on income earning Mm -hmm. um, activities, right? Everything else, I, my philosophy was I can take it all off your plate, anything that requires a license, you should be only spending your time on what is going to produce income for the business, whether that's negotiating a contract going on a listing appointment, you know, those kind of things and everything else I can pull off and I might need your input and your help, but over time I can anticipate what you need and provide it to you ahead of time. That's kind of what my philosophy was. I would imagine there are a lot of people on this call who are working with staff members, operation members, team members, uh, staff who they they probably are doing good. Some of them are probably wishing that their staff knew how to do these things better. Um, Tell us a little bit about your coaching and what that offers to real estate agents and to their staff. Like what, what do you go through with employees? So we have three kind of, I think of it in three different boxes. And I will say there's different types of assistants. We tend to just call them assistants or admin in the real estate world. And yet there, there are different levels and roles, right? Emily, I would, I, I don't even honestly know what your role is other than you're amazing at what you do. But I think there are some people who are just leverage, right? They're assistants, they're task doers, they're taking things off your list. And then there's operations people who are actual partners with you in the business. They're helping you focus on growing the business, not just maintaining and doing the business, right? So there's there's different types. So we have um, we have a class called Ten. Actually, Sky brought me in a couple of times to teach this for um, on the East Coast. Ten Secrets of a Mega EA, and that is a class for the team owner and the operations person to learn how to think about the business together. 
And so what we learn, what we know is a lot of people can teach you how to do the things like check the list and follow the, you know, follow this and do the serum. But before you do that, we skip the step of learning how to think and we have to teach people how to think big. And once they do that, then they can come into your business and do all the things. Mm -hmm. um, then we have a group coaching program, which is a small group. It's led by um, operations coaches who are boots on the ground. Their primary roles are in real estate and then they coach as a passion. This is their, their extra thing. And so those are small groups where they meet um, several times a month in small groups and then in a larger mastermind. Because what we know is for an admin to be successful in real estate, what they really need is a community. They don't need to have all the answers. They have to have a place to find the answers. And the behavioral profile of the typical admin is not super assertive, is not, you know, like I, I laughed coming on the call this morning because I could tell it was agents because everybody was talking and getting along. And if it had been an admin call, everybody would have been typing on their laptop, you know, it's just a yes. different vibe, right? But once you put them in a small group together, they become very comfortable. And now we've got resources we can problem solve together and, and figure out, well, my agent wants to do this. Who has done that before? And now we can share and we can get to the next level. And then we have one-on-one -on -one coaching, which is mastery coaching, which is probably very similar to what many of you are enrolled in if you're in one-on-one -on -one coaching, um, where they meet one, you know, once a week and they're really customized, working on the whole person, not just the business. We believe you need to be whole all the way healthy in all areas of life to be successful in business. So that's kind of the three different things. That's great. Oh, you said so many things here that are so key. Well, first of all, getting clear on the role, because you're right, not all staff members hold the same role. And I think as real estate agents, sometimes we want our staff to do, if we have one employee, we want them to be all things to do all things. And that can be really tricky if the person, what I've noticed, if it is a, a task doer, a detail oriented person, and perhaps you want them to do some marketing or something like that, that might not be their strong suit. So I think what you said about really getting clear on what is their role? What did I hire them for? Or if you're thinking about hiring somebody, getting very clear on what it is you're looking for. Are you looking for a task doer? Are you looking for a marketing person? Are you looking for an operations person that's more of a partner in business, like you said? So um, let's see, where can we go with this? I well, let, Emily, I love that. Let me just plus sure. that a little bit with the, I'm a very practical person. So those of you who are hiring for the first time or you just have one assistant, I think we do make the mistake of wanting them to be great at everything. And so what I tell people is to write your job description and now pick the top two things. You might have 10 or 20 things that you want them to do. Pick the top two things and hire to those two things. You want them to be a 10 out of 10 in performance in those two areas. And then the other areas you want to look for, maybe they're going to be a seven or an eight, right? So maybe customer service because they're going to handle transactions and, you know, organization and detail because they're going to plan client events. Maybe those are your two things. And maybe they can also pay my bills and do some marketing, but it's going to be like a seven or an eight performance there. Mm -hmm. Oh, I like that. Okay. Question for you, Christy. Do you, uh, do you ever have like one-on-ones with actual like team leads about how to actually work with their staff and get the most out of them. I'm happy to consult with anybody about that. Yes. And actually I had the huge honor a week ago of um, giving a brand new keynote and John Maxwell happened to be in the room and I didn't think he, he wasn't supposed to be there. He wasn't supposed to arrive until the afternoon, but he surprised us and came and listened to the morning speakers. And I talked about that exact thing. I talked about leadership and the leadership of the team owner, the agent, the rainmaker. And what I've observed over time is there's an evolution that has to happen from we're, we're really good at what we do as an agent. We're a superstar salesperson. 
right? And that's why we're a top agent because we sell a lot of homes. And then we have to evolve into being a really great business person, right? A brilliant business person. And we have to focus on being profitable and all the things that go along with running our business as a business. <coughs> and the, the leap that most people miss is the final leap, which is life-giving leader. And that's where I talk to people about how they actually can be a great leader to their operations person or their operations team. Oh, that is so true because most of us at some point in our real estate career do go from you, you start doing really great in business and then you start to bring on employees, but a lot of us actually haven't led employees or staff members. So it's a whole new uh, box of tools and resources that we're looking for. What would you say um, when you're coaching to um, staff, what would you say some of their frustrations are with agents? The number one, and this is going to, if you take one thing away today, if you have an assistant or an admin or an ops team, this is going to be the easiest thing ever. And it sounds so simple that you're going to be like, oh, well, of course I do that. The number one complaint is they can't get enough time with their agent and they don't want a lot of time. I tell people do the two, two meetings a week, a total of 90 minutes. And if you do that consistently all year long, your business will completely transform and your life will transform as well. So you do 30 minutes. I like to do it on Monday. I do it with my ops boss on Monday. We do 30 minutes focused on her goals, personal and business. She walks me through what her big rocks of the week's week are. And we're just kind of, it's all focused on her. She's making sure that she's clear on what her priorities are and what order they're in. Yeah. 30 minutes, boom, done. Also, I get to know like what her personal goals are. And she tells me about her garden that she's planting and how she's saving money and all the things so that I know how I can help her personally as well as in business. Because when she's successful personally, she's going to be successful in business. And then we do a once a week um, meeting for 60 minutes on Thursdays. Um, we call it our business meeting. It's her agenda, her goals, her questions. She runs the meeting. She runs through. She asks for my feedback. She asks for, you know, my vision on something. She will say like, oh, hey, I've worked on this. I've got it up to like an eight out of 10. What would make it a 10 out of 10 for you? Um, any kind of help she needs, maybe access to people, clearing roadblocks, and 90 minutes a week will completely change. I have actually had operations people leave their teams because they can't get those meetings with their agents and they get frustrated. That's probably the biggest complaint. Oh my gosh, Christy. I remember back in the day when I was a director of operations that that was the staff's biggest complaint. And I know, you know, as agents, we are so busy and we are going a million different places all of the time. And it seems like it would be the easiest thing to remove one of those meetings from your calendar, but big picture, it's probably one of the most detrimental thing you detrimental things you could do is not actually having that connection with your assistant or your staff member because they're actually there to support you, but when they don't know what you need, we can't be mind readers, right? Yeah, and when you cancel the meeting, the message you're sending is that you're not important. Yeah. Definitely. Like imagine if it was your significant other and you had a date night and it was a standing date night every Wednesday night at 8 p.m. And then every Wednesday you're like, oh, hey, I'm going out with the guys or, you know, I'm stopping at so-and-so's house on the way home. It wouldn't go over so well, right? So we want to treat our partner in business that way. That's a great metaphor. I got that one. If my if my partner canceled a date night on me, ooh, yeah, we would not be doing so good. <laughs> exactly. So, all right. What is? Can you give us a couple tips? That's a great that that's a huge huge um, tip. But can you give us a couple tips that our agents on this call can use? 
with their staff members today to show um, appreciation, essentially. What is it that staff is looking for? What would go a long way without put, outputting too much? Well, I, I would say take off the without putting too much on the end, because what you invest, you know, it's, it's an investment, what you're doing. So if you want a big return, you want to invest at a high level. Um, I think number one, I would make sure you know what the love language is of the people on your team. Super easy. You, there's, you can take the test online. Most people probably even know what their love language is without even taking the test if you ask them. Um, because sometimes agents think that money solves a lot of problems, and it does solve a lot of problems, and we're here to be profitable and to make money. That's the object of the game. And many people in the operations world, as long as they're making what they should be making, they're not being underpaid, if they're being paid well, they're not going to be looking for money. They're going to be looking for words of affirmation, appreciation, you know, spending time, quality time together, those are probably the two love languages that I see the most within the operations world. Not to say that people don't want to be paid money and all the things, but take them out to lunch, write them a handwritten note, be specific about what you appreciate about them, not just telling them all the time how awesome they are, but actually spending time with them. I think those are really easy things that we can do. And I think the commitment to the meeting regularly goes a long way, right? I think so too, Christy. Uh, my friend and I were actually uh, heading back from an event in Denver, and we were talking about the, the four, now five love languages uh, and knowing them, I think it's important to actually know our own love language as well, because it it really, it, it helps us in all relationships. So what a great tool to uh, ask your, your employee to actually take and take yourself as well. Um, I remember back in the day when I was the director of ops, my uh, the woman I worked for at that time, she knew my love language and she would send me to the spa. She would give me spa days when she knew I was getting and she always knew when I was close to burning out and being just done with things. All of a sudden there'd be a gift card to our local spa. Uh, she had me dialed in. So I love that idea. <laughs> Uh, so, oh, this is a great question, Holly, and I see that and I agree with you. What about working with virtual assistants? Do you, do you have any suggestions for our agents that might not have a staff member that's just working for them, that's working with a virtual assistant? How can they make the best of that relationship? So my ops boss is virtual as well. Um, and I will tell you for many, many years, I had a lot of limiting beliefs around that because we always worked as a team together in the office. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what it means is you just have to be a little more purposeful than you would um, if you're in an office together. So for example, my ops boss is Brooke. And in addition to our do the two meetings, right, um, we do monthly coffee. We have a coffee date and she brings her, neither of us really drink coffee. She brings her tea and I bring my water and we jump on Zoom and we just literally business is off the table for 30 minutes and we chat and she tells me about her chickens that she's going to get. She's a, a country girl and I'm a city girl. Like, I don't even know what chickens are. And it's <laughs> fascinating. And we have this great conversation. And I tell her about my upcoming trip to Paris because that, that's always on my mind. And we just spend time together. Um, but that's why those two meetings also become more important because you can't casually pass in the office and just say like, oh, hey, by the way. Can you do this? Um, we keep um, Slack and Facebook Messenger both up all day long so that we can communicate. Now, I will say your ops person does need to have some time block time where they're not responding immediately to everything because otherwise they won't get anything done. But just to be in agreement about when you're in communication, how you communicate, 
Um, one of the things that I did that has made a huge difference is I wrote a CEO user manual and she wrote her user manual as our systems boss. And it has everything in it from our disk profile to our love languages to do we communicate on weekends? Do we communicate at night? How quickly should we respond to each other? Um, I'm super high D and here's what it looks like, but it, I really do love you and I'll use my emojis. Like it has everything in it and it has allowed us to communicate way better. Is that something, is that program something that you sell? Because it totally should be. I would imagine agents and would love to do this with their staff to have that profile. If that you go on our blog um, or e just email me, Christy, I'll put my um, email in the chat. I'm happy to send you the blog post. I wrote a blog post and gave you some examples. You really have to write your own. Yes. Because we're all different, but it, I, I'll give you kind of like the, um, here we go. As you're okay. writing guidelines. Yeah, exactly what Sarah just said. Communication guidelines are key. I mean, it's the, it's, why we have positive relationships or why relationships go to the wayside. So this is super, super great. Um, how do you see having a staff member or employee help agents have more balance in their life? I think if you can... I I, I know this is really basic, but if we take everything off of their plate, except for the income generating activities, that gives them time, right? I mean, we're, a lot of ops people come into operations like I did looking for balance. Of course, I ended up working a lot more hours because I love what I do, but you're looking for balance. So we can exchange that balance. I, I get my nights and weekends as an operations person, right? Because I'm not licensed, I'm not negotiating. And if you're an agent and you're in production, that's when your clients are available and you need to be available during that time. But if we can take all the stuff off of you during the week, you've got balance. You can go to your children's you know, school play or you can go to their soccer, pick them up at soccer practice, whatever that is. I think there's lots of creative ways to do that. And it really, you also may have assistants that may work nights and weekends because that's when they're available. It's all about expectations and just being in agreement about what the expectations are and making sure that it's a win-win for both parties, right? And then there's lots of creative ways you can construct it. Yeah, once again, going back to communicating clearly as the base foundation, communicating your expectations clearly so that everyone is on the same page and everybody agrees to what the process, what the systems, what the hours, what everything is going to look like um, so that you can actually get things done and find that balance. This is this is such a great call. Uh, what, what advice would you have for, so we have, I, I know on this call, we have some staff members, kind of staff members, like agent experience managers, marketing advisors, uh, transaction coordinators. We have some staff members, Encompass employee staff members on the call. What insight or advice would you give them for working with agents? Agents secretly want you to tell them what to do. <laughs> so don't wait. Don't wait. Tell them what you think would make things better. Yes. Educate yourself to the highest level. Learn everything you can, not just about your role, but learn everything you can about real estate in general, about running businesses in general, about personal development and growth grow yourself as much as you can, and then bring your gifts and talents to your agent, to your team, to your division, whatever it is, because you are there for a reason. You are there because you are wired differently. You have different gifts and talents. And when you put them together with the visionary or the sales or the other, the things that your agent and your team owner are great at, that's when the magic happens, right? Yes. We need each other to work together. And when we work together, it's crazy fun. 
Oh my gosh. You are speaking to all of us here, we do want you to tell us what to do. Uh, we want to, for all of you who are on the call, we want to know where your, your expertise, and that's why we ask you the questions. You know, there are agents out there that are really incredible, let's say, with marketing and understanding marketing. But for the majority of us as agents, we're out there selling, we're out there working with our buyers and our sellers. So we do want that insight. That is so great. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I love also that you talked about as staff, what staff can do. Learn everything that you can do to be a resource. Um, learn everything you can about running a business what your real estate agent is going through, what it looks like to be an entrepreneur, um, and then be able to be there with them. Uh, <laughs> this is amazing. Musa says, being married to my ops director, I absolutely love this call. Oh, okay, let's go there because you do work with family, Christy. How does it, how do you make it work in the best way possible, that well-oiled machine when you're working with family in a family environment. Tell us some secrets there. I think you have to be very clear on roles and very clear on responsibility and decision-making, who has the decision-making ability, who has the input ability, who is going to, and also staying in, as your team grows, staying in your lane. Mm -hmm. Because it's often hard for the per whoever, usually in a family business, there's one person that was like the original salesperson or the original, and then other family comes onto the team. But as that other family comes on, let them own their role, let them own whatever it is that they're in charge of. Mm -hmm. um, and then having, um, for me, my husband also at one point was tangentially involved in similar business we had to have rules that after a certain time of night, we weren't going to talk about it. One thing that I do see on the coaching side that can be a challenge as you're growing a team when there's a family um, dynamic going on is conversations happen outside the office and the rest of the team doesn't know what's going on or wasn't included in those conversations. So sometimes you may have to say, you know, A, let's not talk about this after dinner is over or before dinner starts and B um, making sure that the other team members on your team know who to go to for different things so that they're not, they're not doing the, you know, what the game we all played when we were kids and you wanted to go spend the night at your friend's house. And you'd be like, mom said, if you said it was okay. And then you go to dad, dad said, if you said it was okay, don't let that dynamic happen on your team. That's such good advice. Um, I think that's one thing, well, multiple things you said, but one thing I think is crucial is allowing people to own their own roles and to be very careful about micromanaging. Um, if there's a situation, if there's an issue with, let's say, a staff member and they're not doing what you'd like them to do, I think at that point, instead of micromanaging, there's a better way to communicate with staff. And Christy, would you speak to that? What if you have a staff member that you're potentially frustrated with, or you think they're not doing things in the way that they should be, or that you want them to be? What would be, what would be a list of steps to take or actions to take with that staff member? So number one, the frustration comes from the gap of expectation that you have an expectation of this and it's not being met. And that gap of expectation can be closed by those weekly meetings. Yeah. If, and so frustration often comes because it builds up over time and we're not having clear communication. And if you're having the weekly meetings, you can have the clear communication. Um, number two, the expectations issue also happens when we are not clear on our expectation. So for example, I might say to my admin, my customer service is really, really important to me, like how we treat our clients and we need to be very responsive to our clients. 
that feel I'm the agent and that feels like I've been very clear. I've stated my expectation. Well, what does responsive mean to you? Does responsive mean that you answer every call when it rings? Does responsive mean you, you return calls by the end of the day, you return calls within 24 hours? Like there's a whole gamut of what responsive could mean. So until you articulate what that means, the person cannot meet that expectation and then frustration grows. So I think it, that you have to be super clear and operations people, if you are not clear, it's up to you to ask the questions of, hey, can you paint that for me? Oftentimes people will say like, I want you to do this project or that project, but they haven't really painted the vision. So paint it for me. What would that look like when it's done? What would make it a 10 out of 10 for you? What does it have to include? Make sure you're asking lots of questions so that you can do what they're looking for. And I think sometimes um, you can close that gap. And I think also the third thing I would say is trust. If you have feedback and you need to give feedback and we all need feedback, we want feedback, I want feedback, I can't get better without feedback. I want to receive that feedback from someone I trust. And so one of the tips I always tell people when they're working with their admin is make sure you're investing as much time in your relationship as you are in your business. We often work on our business a lot, but we don't work on our relationships. But the more you work on your relationships, the more trust develops and the more your team will be able to have those open conversations with feedback because we all need that. So true. I, um, I think, you know, it was something I've heard back in the day from a lot of staff or employees is that they're afraid to ask the questions to get the clarification because the agent is so busy, they're afraid they're going to frustrate them. And so they don't ask uh, and they keep trying to mind read, which isn't workable. And I would, I would say at that point, I used to say to people, even if said agent is going to get frustrated with you in that moment, isn't it better to know what they want and need so that you can serve them long-term, bigger picture in a way that's actually going to be meaningful? Uh, so I think for us as agents as well, let your staff members know, like, if you don't understand or if you need more clarity, let them know that it's okay to ask and ask again and to get clarity because that's really, truly the key. Communication is the key. That's literally where our group coaching, our operations group coaching program originated from that exact issue, because what we determined is there's about a 30 to 60, sometimes 90 day period where a brand new operations person is willing and able and comfortable asking questions. And at a certain point, they feel like they're bothering their agent and they back down from asking the questions our group provides that safe space where they can ask questions of other people who have been through this, who have done this before. So then they can go back and get encouragement also to ask the questions they really need to ask their agent um, and do that and use the group for the other questions because that does happen. It's just a behavioral profile thing with many of them. I have a friend who, um, one of my best friends has a real estate team in Texas. And they did 6 million in GCI last year. And English is her second language. And I, one of the things I've learned from her is she will always ask, and you would never know it by hearing her speak. She, she doesn't have any signs of an accent. She always asks when she doesn't understand a vocabulary word that you've used. If, she, if you use a word that she's never heard, she will always ask. And I learned from her, like, you have to ask questions. That's the only way to grow. And she has no embarrassment. She just says, oh, I've never heard that. What does that mean? I love that. I yeah. love that. And everybody has their, you know, even if we're using a term, like if I think about this, I'm going to put this into the metaphor of, it's not even a metaphor, but I'm going to put this into uh, whenever I go to get my hair cut and I say, I want to trim. I realize that a trim to me means like an eighth of an inch where to a hairdresser, that can mean two inches. It happens every time. 
So we have to really think about how our words, like trim to me means one thing, where trim to a hairstylist might mean something completely different. 100%. Getting that clarification. This has been so insightful. I have so many. I'm going to ask you one last question because Betty has a good question. And then we'll wrap up the call. We do something called the Rapid Six at Six, Christy, where we I ask you six fast questions and we learn a little bit more about you as well. Okay. Okay. So Betty, and this is something that we see, let's say we have an agent that's a driver agent that does a lot of, it works fast, very efficient. How do you get an assistant to work faster, she says. She's a rapid person and gets a lot done. How does she get her assistant to keep up with her pace to mirror and match? Well, I, and I totally get that because that is me. You just described me to a T. Um, I think you have to screen for that in your hiring process, number one. And so one thing that I notice people don't do is they don't do a road test. I did a road test with my last hire that made all the difference in the world. And what I did is I gave her um, a sample project that I wanted her to do. And I wanted her to only spend one hour on it. I gave her very little direction because the person I was looking to hire, I needed them to be very self-managed, self-led and confident. And I needed them to move quickly. And then I told, I asked her, when can you have it back to me? And you have 15 minutes to ask me whatever questions you want and then present me the project. The person I hired was head over heels above the other people that I had to do the project. So I knew that I had that person. So I would say road test them. Um, and then the second thing is going back to those meetings, Betty, I would just make sure that you're super clear on what the priorities are and the sequence of the priorities and ask the question by when, when you hand off something to someone, when will you have it back to me by when? And then you, I, you want to hold them accountable, not for their time, but for their results. Yes. So if you're having those meetings once a week, then you hold them accountable to your, here's the top three things I need done this week. That's so good. The other thing is if you have someone who is working slowly because they're a perfectionist, you may need to give them per permission and direction of, hey, on this project, I need it to be done at a six out of 10. It's okay if it's not perfect. I, it's being fast is more important. On this project, I need it to be a nine out of 10 because it's going to my luxury buyers and it needs to look beautiful and be beautiful. So be as detailed as you can about your expectations about what's okay and what's not okay. Oh my gosh. That is such a golden nugget key. Thank you, Christy. Ah, this is so good. So good. All right, Christy, because we are coming to time and I know we have other questions. If you all have questions for Christy, feel free to reach out to her. Um, but let's ask Christy our five at five or rapid six at six. So Christy, first and foremost, tell us what does your ideal day look like? Oh my gosh. Right now, my ideal day is I don't get up at 6 a.m. because my <laughs> husband coaches um, college and high school baseball and we're often eating dinner at 10 p.m. at night. So my ideal day is I wake up, I pray, I shower, I do my affirmations. I have a video that I watch that I created based on the One Thing book where it reminds me about what is important to me. It's like a two minute video and I'm motivated and I jump in. Um, I'm doing coaching calls. I keep a small elite roster of coaches. Um, I'm meeting with my team and pouring into people. And then I'm hanging out with my husband who I will be celebrating my 40th anniversary with this summer. Oh my gosh. Congratulations. That is awesome. What is one thing that you would love to master? Oh, one thing that I would love to master, probably patience. <laughs> Good luck. Good luck. <laughs> if you could time travel either into the future, into the past, anywhere in space, place, and time, when and where would you like to go? I think I would go forward. I love my coaching clients. I'm very passionate about my coaching clients, and I would love to go forward in time and see how they've grown and what they're doing and how they're changing the world. I loved how you started the call 
talking about changing the world because our vision at Ops Boss Coaching is one by one by one by one, we change the world. That mm-hmm. just so I would love to see what's happening in the future. That's lovely. That's lovely. What is one book or one movie that you like to go back to time and time again? I never watch movies because like I said, I don't have a lot of patience. Um, (laughs) One book that I go back to, okay, besides the Bible, I would say 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership by John Maxwell. Ooh, okay. Writing that one down. Yeah. I really love that one. Um, There's a self-evaluation that you can do in there and it's fun to kind of go back and see where I've grown, where are my blind spots? What can I be working on? Great. Okay. It's 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership by John Maxwell. Some are just asked. Thank you. Thank you. Two more questions for you. Who was your first celebrity childhood crush? Oh my God. I don't know if I really had one. I met my husband when I was 17. So Uh (laughs) I don't know, David Cassidy, probably. I'm so old that the Partridge family was on TV when I was a kid. That's awesome. I love it. I love it. Okay. Final question for you. What is the first thing you're going to do after you get off this call with us? Oh, okay. Now you'll bring me to tears. I'm getting on a coaching call and I'm I'll, this has nothing to do with admin. I'm getting on a coaching call with a client who lost her 19-year-old son to fentanyl. Oh. And today is his 22nd birthday. So I will share the message of JJ, who is the most amazing kid and who tried something once and made a mistake and it cost him his life. So if you have children, grandchildren, nieces, nephews, friends, please tell them about Jay. And my client, Tanya, has a mission called Smiles for Jay. Go and do something nice for someone today and tell them it was for JJ and tell them to pass it on. Oh, oh my goodness. Thank you, Christy. That was, you were meant to share that with us this morning. It has been such a pleasure. Thank you for sharing your wisdom with all of us. Uh, agents on the call, if you are interested in getting in touch with Christy, Ops Boss Coaching uh, would be incredibly beneficial to your staff members. Reach out to Christy. Thank you so much for sharing your morning and spending it with us, Christy. Emily, thank you so much for having me. I am so, I loved your energy this morning. All of you guys were so awesome. When I first got on the call before Emily got on, I was, what a great community you guys have built here. Mm, thank you. John, take us away. I love you. I love you. This morning I woke up with this feeling.